Oh man. Okay, so it says that we are live. Ooh, fun. Ready, ready. Um one second, I make sure I have everything. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lyra. I'm here with Isabella Gomez from One Day at a Time. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. It's so funny. We've been on Zoom. For, <laughs> like, so how are you today? <laughs> how are you? Start over. Forget everything I said before. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, I know we mentioned this earlier. I live in a Latina household, so I apologize in advance if, you know, you get some gritos or anything in there in the background. Like, Me I know, too. yeah, you're like, I hope they don't say anything loud. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> um, so, first of all, I want to say thank you for speaking with me. And as a queer Latina myself, Elena is an icon of strength that tells a different kind of, like, queer story. So how does it feel knowing your portrayal of Elena has spoken to and touched many queer people? It's so crazy. I mean, I feel almost like a broken record because I always say the same sort of idea, but I never in a million years expected something like this. And to be able to play a role that actually means something to people and that adds to my life as well. And like to be embraced by this community and have so much grace be given to me and be taught so much is more than I could have ever asked for and obviously it's incredibly rewarding and it's also just really fun playing a character that's layered and has a lot to play with and has something to say and knows where she stands is just the most fun as an actor so I'm I'm pretty lucky I love it and Elena is this stereotype I feel like for the overachieving Latina and <laughs> why do you think Elena is like that and do you relate to her um, well, the LA Times, I believe, did an article about this, about how we're seeing a trend on TV now of genius Latinas. And I think that is super cool, especially for the Latinx community for so long, our representation was so dark and just inaccurate and, and stereotyped and just a little corner of what we really are as a community. So I think it's super cool to see a Latina like this. This is more like the Latinas that I know in my personal life. I mean, my mother is the stereotype of a Latina genius. She is actually insane. Um, <laughs> but I think it's this way because I think people are starting to notice, especially in this country, that Latina women have to work six times, 10 times, 20 times as hard to get to the same places. And because of that, we've created such an incredible work ethic and we are actually incredibly intelligent and have so much to offer so to get that on tv and be shown that is is pretty amazing um i mean I, i'm not gonna be like i relate to being a latina genius <laughs> <laughs> but i do i do relate to being very outspoken and having really strong convictions and morals and educating myself as much as i can um especially during really this time school huh I said, especially during this time. Totally. And so I, I think actually Elena is also a little bit of like a quote unquote stereotype of my generation and, and how involved we all are starting to be and how active we are and all of this. So I, I think she's dope. I love it. I think I'm going to give you a question from Twitter. Let's see. From Queer Delion, she asked or they asked, what do you think Elena will be doing in quarantine? Oh my God. Um, which, which section of quarantine? Cause I feel like we've lived 60 million lives. Oh my God. Yes. It's been a couple months and it's, it feels like 2020 is going on forever. Forever. I feel like an, uh, I'm, I've aged six years. In <laughs> months. Um, I think beginning of quarantine, Elena would definitely be super strict and crazy and trying to like educate her household. I don't see Alex adhering to the rules super strictly <laughs> so I'm sure she would have a lot to say about that um doing a ton of research because obviously she wants to make sure everything is fact-based and I think now in the moment we are now I think Elena would be at every single protest I think she would be posting all the links donating anything she can educating those around her I think some really meaningful conversations would be happening in the Alvarez household so I mean, I, I wish we had Elena in real life to help us along in this. 
Yeah, I mean, like you were saying, Elena is kind of the representation of our generation. There are there are a lot of Elenas. Maybe for us, like at least for me, this is the first time I've seen somebody that is like me on TV, and it's just, it's. I feel like it's a gift. It's it's something fantastic, and I'm so grateful to have you on the show, just doing what you do. Like, thank you. I mean, representation <laughs> matters, and it's it's something that has. I feel like become a hashtag and so people don't like listen to the weight of it as much but truthfully when you first see somebody on tv that you're like oh my god that is like me or like my family it holds so much weight and it's so validating and I think representation matters so much and I hope especially with everything happening now that we will be moving into a more accurate Hollywood world that represents the real world more yeah and so if I saw myself in Elena, like who have you seen yourself in? Like when you think about Latinx representation? It's hard because I, I was born and raised in Colombia and okay. and I'm white passing. So yeah. when I was watching all the shows, they were dubbed in Spanish and all the girls looked like me, like Selena Gomez and Miley Cyrus and Demi Lovato. We like they all felt similar to me. So I never really understood the concept of representation until I started hearing more about it and then I saw Jane the Virgin and I was like this is what they mean when they say oh like it's me on tv because this wasn't just like somebody that happened to look like me or a family that happened to look like me but a family that worked and had a lot of the same morals and had like the both languages and had all of these things that are so prevalent in my life so I think that's when I started really it started really clicking I haven't watched that yet. I have to. Jane the Virgin. It's such a good show. It's such a good show. (laughs) And Elena fights against the preconceptions of older generations when it comes to her queer pride. Where does Elena get this strength from to be unapologetically queer? I think from so many places, but I think from Lydia and Penelope. Lydia and Penelope are unapologetically themselves. And they are so strong in, in their morals and they're, they're really who they are at their core all the time. And they taught Elena that even, even if who she is, she might've been scared that it was something that they weren't going to like. She has been conditioned to be a strong, independent woman that is going to be herself regardless of what people think. And so I think that is where that comes from. And it's so interesting that the values instilled in her by her elders are kind of what could have caused conflict, except of course we saw that incredible monologue that Lydia has flipping it all around and being like, no, this is okay. Thank you very much. I was just thinking about that. And like, I remember seeing that and just being blown away. She's like, who am I? Who am I to question? Like, but I've never looked at it like that, that you were, Elena was taught to be a strong, independent woman and it transitions into her being queer. Mm -hmm. So cool. And cool. where would you like to see Elena's storyline go when um, One Day at a Time returns? God, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a writer. <laughs> and we have brilliant, brilliant writers that make the show what it is. Um, I'm very interested to see where the story keeps going. Obviously, we see at the beginning of the season that Elena is figuring out college and, and doing that process. And seeing where she's going to go and what that means for her relationship and what that means for all of the relationships in her life. And I I don't think we've talked about yet, like what she's hoping to major in or anything like that. And I think those are all very, very interesting points, especially for somebody that is such an activist and, and so outspoken. I wonder what field she's going to go into. I'm, I'm partial to law, but that might just be, I was actually, before I got the show, was going to go into law school. Um, oh. Not going to go, but that was my path. I was in high school when I got the show. Um, so I think it would be cool to live vicariously through Elena and do a little bit of that. So it's changed your life. You didn't expect to go down this road, but here you are. Yeah, I, I mean, think- this is a road I wanted to go down, but it was my, my junior year of high school. And I was like, all right, And I had been in LA for a while. Well, not a while. I had been in LA for six months. (laughs) But 
things weren't happening and that's just how the industry goes. But I definitely was of the mindset of if it's not, if I'm not on a show, if I'm not actively working, then I need to be at least going through that plan B and my plan B had always been law. So thank God I uh -huh. got the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you been working on any other projects? Back then? No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Back then there before this quarantine time. Um, yeah. Any other projects besides one day at a time? Um, I'm still, you mean when I was in high school or now before quarantine? Oh, no, no, no. Now before quarantine. So I, I was actually supposed to take my horror film Dembanger to South by Southwest in March. So that would have happened, but we actually, the release came out today that it's called Initiation now and mm -hmm. it has been picked up. It's going to get a little theatrical release, obviously once the world is back and theaters are back <laughs> but that's super exciting um and then no I was really we were in the middle of the season when all of this happened um yeah so how was it working on a scary movie so much fun I <laughs> never even considered that genre for me and it was such a blast and and this is a really uh special scary movie because it it's has a lot to say and um it has, it touches on subjects that are very near and dear to me. And so I was super excited to get to do that. I got to reunite with Fred Gutierrez who played Josh season one. So that was so fun. And then just getting to see how all the special effects are done is super cool. But also what was special about this one, it's like, it was a super indie, it was a passion project for the producers. We filmed an entire horror movie in two weeks. What? which is crazy that's insane insane and it was all a young cast it's it's a bunch of college students so especially when we we're doing night shoots we were doing night shoots a little bit outside of LA so we got to all get an Airbnb and like all live together and we would like come home at 7 a.m drenched in blood and like go through the like McDonald's <laughs> and we were like <laughs> okay and we were like too exhausted to care like all right peace and love everyone we're gonna oh my god <laughs> I can't even imagine that it was the best um and I'm gonna give you another question from someone on Twitter from my short Demi L uh they asked who would you love to see guest star on an episode of one day at a time well, now I have to come up with a new answer because <laughs> Mr. Lynn Manuel Miranda, who I've been begging and screaming to be on the show, is on the show this season. He was on our politics episode, um, which was, it's an animated episode. We did, did it during Corona and it was so incredible and so timely. Um, so that was my dream guest star. And now I don't know. I mean, listen, I would love to still have him on the show and work with him in person obviously. Um, but I actually think, so Phil Lewis, who a lot of people my age know as Mr. Mosby, um, directs a lot of our episodes. He is an incredible director, but he's still a genius and like a sitcom master. And I think he would be so great on the show. That's fantastic. And talking about the politics episode, how was that? Because it just seemed like a lot of fun and you were a cartoon. How cool is that? It was super fun. I actually really, really love animation. Um, as you can tell, I'm very animated, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a little bit of a problem when you're getting something on film because it's distracting and it's just, it can be a lot and it's something I have to very actively work on, especially, and, and even so in a sitcom where it's a little broader and everything, I still need to bring so, it in. Yes. And so I love doing animation because I get to just sit in a booth in sweatpants and like move around and play and it's so much faster. So you get to do a million different tries. Um, so then transitioning the show into that was super special. It was actually, weirdly enough, a lot harder than I expected it to be because I have an incredible cast. The people on my cast are just stupid talented. And you learn to rely a lot on your scene partners when you're around people that talented and they give you a lot of the information that you're taking in. So sitting in my house with a microphone doing lines without my cast was so <laughs> weird. Um, but it was super cool. And that was actually an episode that we were supposed to air anyway this season. And obviously that was derailed and it ended up working out really well for animation and 
and obviously it's super timely. So we were very excited to get to do that. Yeah, it was so cool seeing sometimes the things that, you know, you're thinking about and an animation for it to come to life. Like Lupita, when she was talking about how she would imagine telling the familia about her views and how it was perfect. I, I just loved every second of it. And I wanted to ask you, what did you learn about yourself from this episode, especially that dialogue at the end? Um where Elena was, you know, trying to see the other side. What did you learn about yourself? Um, God, that's a loaded one. Because <laughs> it's I such a heavy learned, episode. It's a, it's a really heavy episode, um, which, by the way, if you haven't seen it, it's still super funny and you're going to laugh the whole time. But it's heavy because it's so timely. And we obviously didn't mean for it to be as timely as it eventually got to be because of everything going on. Um, but... I think my biggest thing is sometimes I have a hard time having those hard conversations, especially when people see things very differently from me because I just get really passionate and angry and get my feelings very involved and then it's not constructive. So the idea of trying to see it from the other person and the idea of leading with love and and trying to find common ground instead of trying to be shameful or trying to like tell people what they're supposed to believe has really helped me and I've actually really incorporated those things into the conversations I'm having in my real life so that was super nice to be a part of a com like a, a show like that that could potentially start conversations especially right now <laughs> And Elena and Sid are the kind of couple we want to see more of on TV. How has it been working with Sheridan Pierce uh, to bring this ship to life? It's so lovely. Um, Sheridan and I are both actually really awkward people. <laughs> so, it just ends up really working out for what the characters are supposed to be. Um, it's so kind of unfortunate because I feel like this season, it's when we really actually started to come into our own. I think we never expected you never really expect people to fall in love with with ships as they do and so yeah. when it started we had no idea and then when we came back it was like so much pressure to make sure we were doing everything perfect and and what is this going to look like and and just you know do everything right and so i think this season was the first time that we were like okay we know who these characters are we know this relationship and i think now we get to play and it got cut short, <laughs> but it's, it's so lovely. And Sheridan is hilarious. If you haven't seen her TikToks, you should check them out. She is so funny. Okay. She just did one about um, Karen's going to Costco without a mask. And I <laughs> died. Please wear your masks, guys. Don't just wear yes. your masks. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been lovely. And what do you love most about this ship? I think what I love most is that it is so much more accurate to the relationships that I see people that age in real life having than what it's usually represented on TV. Um, I love that they aren't sexualized and they are having real conversations and they're uncomfortable and awkward and weird because when you're 16, 17, 18, that's who you are most yeah. likely in a relationship. And especially, you know, I think female and female presenting people so often in queer relationships get sexualized and, and it's through a male gaze and it's it's this whole thing that then has nothing to do with the relationship itself. So to be able to have this relationship on screen where it is about the love and it is about these people getting to know each other and it is about young love and the first love and the awkwardness and how do we navigate this and we want to make sure this is safe and there's consent and that we're doing everything right but also that's all very heavy stuff and oh this is awkward it's so refreshing and so it, it brings me so much hope that young people are getting to see this show and don't feel pressure to be Hollywood 16 and like Ugh, yeah, I don't even get started on that. <laughs> Hollywood 16. I remember like Smallville where everybody there was 30 and I was like, 16 year olds don't look like that. No, and they don't act like that either. Most of them. I mean, I will say there's a certain breed of 16 year old that is like that and that's great. But again, we should be able to see 
all of it. And what's so funny too, is I remember when the show came out, people were like, we love that one day at a time. There was one tweet that was like, thank God the 15 year old is actually played by a 15 year old, but I was like 18. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me keep quiet. Let me oh. <laughs> let them believe. Um, I find that one of my favorite scenes is when Elena and Sid, you know, they want to like consummate their re- their relationship. They want to take it to the next level. And Ooh. yeah, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen something like that. And it was handled so beautifully. How was it for you, you know, taking on something so heavy? It was one of the toughest episodes I've ever done for the show. It was really, really hard for me because that wasn't my experience and it hasn't been my experience normally and or the experience of people I know. Um, And so it was like a little bit triggering, but also then it felt like so much pressure because I knew how special this moment was and I knew what it could mean to people and I knew that if I had seen this conversation modeled for me on a show that I admired, things might've been different. And not to say that my experiences were horrific or anything, they were totally lovely in their own way. It just wasn't that. And it just wasn't that level of understanding and and partnership and this knowledge of consent and, and of what this means for people. And so it was really, really tough, Um, but, so rewarding. I think one of the most rewarding episodes I've ever done too. And um, I got a lot of help through it. I, this is when it really pays off to have a cast and a crew that feels like family. I remember like texting Gloria, our showrunner and Michelle Badillo, who was one of our writers for the first three seasons. who I was very close to and just like ranting and spilling and like making sure that I was separating my experiences from Elena's and doing justice to her story. And I'm rambling now, but no, it, no. Was, it was hard, but it was lovely. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you another question from somebody on Twitter. Um, Caitlin N. Stein asked, did you feel any pressure while portraying Elena coming out? And they also said that storyline is why I came out, by the way. So, oh, <laughs> uh, that's I mean, that's amazing. And every time I hear it, that's crazy to hear. Um, I I didn't feel any pressure season one because we made the show in a bubble. We, we filmed all 13 episodes before it ever came out. And so I was blissfully unaware of what it would mean to people. Um, I grew up doing a lot of theater and a lot of my friends were LGBTQ. So I never thought anything of it. And it also, like, I obviously was aware that there was oppression and there was all this stuff, but I hadn't really seen it in my personal life. And so it it hadn't really registered in my brain. And I saw people in the relationships that I was in on TV. So the representation aspect didn't click in my head either. So thankfully, I didn't feel any pressure season one because I think it would have been, it was just, it's going to be too much. This was my first series regular and it was my first, you know, real time with like a real character like that on tv and so then to put something like that on top of it would have been crazy but I did know that it required um I don't know how to like not attention but like a lot of I I wanted to be very particular about the way that I was doing it and I had a, a ton of conversations with my lgbtq friends and our lgbtq writers about her arc and making sure that it was as representative and as positive as it could be and so in that way I felt pressure but not from the outside world because even at that point you're kind of like is anybody even going to see the show who knows and then it becomes a hit and then everyone's (laughs) watching it oh has that like like being on the show has it given you like have important conversations happened in your real life because of the show absolutely Uh, it's been very interesting because I booked the show my first audition for the show, I was 17. I booked it when I was 18 and I'm 22 now. And so a lot of my really formative years have been spent on this show and have, and the show has been the catalyst for a lot of the changes I've had in my life and a lot of, um, morals that I've formed and and friendships that I've formed. Um, so it's definitely started a lot of conversations. It's definitely started a lot of 
my own research that I like to do now. And it's, it's made me so much more of an empath and, and to be able to step into Elena's shoes and, and understand what the LGBTQ community goes through all the time. And, and also that being uh, made a part of this community somehow, I don't know how I got so lucky, <laughs> has been one of the biggest blessings of my life. Like I always say, I've never met a group of people that is more loving and empathetic and kind and willing to be there for each other and willing to like create these chosen families that are so beautiful. So I, I've definitely grown a lot because of the show and I feel very lucky to be able to get to do that. And do you have a favorite line that just has stuck with you like months later from the show? Yeah, I'm actually, I don't have any tattoos. <laughs> um, I live in a Latino household, so I have to wait till I don't if I ever want to get any, if I don't want to get disowned, you know? I feel you. Um, <laughs> but I was toying with the idea of getting Dare to Dream tattooed on me. Um, she, Elena says that season one, when Lydia's saying, oh, like every girl's going to want to be in your dress. And Elena says, Dare to Dream. So I thought it would be a nice nod to the show, but also to how I live my life. I actually, I used to want to get Dreamer tattooed on me, but then obviously there's so much political weight on that. Um, so I thought Dare to Dream would be a nice thing that has the same message and also is a nod to the show. So that's my favorite line. And I'm going to ask you another Twitter question from Just Ariel WG Mez. Um, what are three interesting facts about you? <laughs> I know, heavy. Well, in a different like, way. Y'all think I'm way more interesting than I really am, guys. Here's that. Um, interesting fact. All of a sudden, I know nothing about myself. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess one that I talked about is I, I actually wanted to um, go into criminal justice. My dad's a lawyer, and he kind of raised me debating with him and learning how to stick to my point of view. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would have really liked to have gone into something like that. Um, I originally did not think that I would ever do comedy, and I, I didn't think I was funny at all. So it was a huge surprise to me when I booked a sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're killing it. Thank you. I mean, listen, I've had a lot of training too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my first language is Spanish, which doesn't seem like a fun fact, but anytime I post a story in Spanish, I get like 50 DMs being like, wait a minute. Who <laughs> so, are you? <laughs> who are you? And fun fact, when I speak in Spanish, my voice is way lower. And I don't know why I don't do that on purpose, but that's just the tea. No, no, I, I went on a research spiral and Google for some reason has some small clips on the bottom of common questions that people have I asked. I did that this year. Yeah. Isn't that so crazy that that's it's a real so thing? so cool. So weird. So weird. So like the one where you were speaking Spanish and they were asking you if you like think in Spanish or in English. I was like, when did Google start doing this? It's, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I like went to... This was actually right, right before lockdown. You like go to some headquarters and they like ask you well, like what people most Google about you. And then you do little clips so that you can answer it yourself. And I was like, this is crazy. I don't understand technology. Technology is amazing. <laughs> and who would you like to work with in the future? I'm talking like dream project here. It's at times like this that I wish I was a theater person because I feel like it's so much easier to be like, this is my dream thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, as cheesy as it sounds, I think I am doing my dream role right now in Elena. So it's going to be hard for anything to live up to her. But anything, my dream role is just to continue working on projects where I feel like the character is layered and has something to say and is accurate to whatever they're representing and that I feel fulfilled, and hopefully that the cast and crew really get along. <laughs> <laughs> but as for people, I'm obsessed with Florence Pugh, and I would do anything to work with her. <laughs> Putting You put it out into the world, it could happen. I gotta put it out into the world, because she's just, I just watched um, 
Midsommar. Is that how you pronounce it? Everybody pronounces it. I think it so. Different. Everybody pronounces it differently. But that movie. And I just am so blown away by her. It's incredible. Talent. Talent all over. Um, and I want to ask you another question from someone on Twitter. Eliza says 42, and they ask what fandoms that they've incorporated into Elena's character on the show um, that are actually a part of you as well. Basically, are you as geeky as her? No. I feel so bad saying that. <laughs> I'm like shattering the illusion. Um, because I, but here's the thing is that it's not even because I don't like what she likes is that I haven't even seen what she likes because I'm a reality TV junkie and also like a docu, like I like watching like documentaries and reality TV where it's like real people, sometimes scripted TV and films feel like too much to process. And I have a real short attention span. So no, however, fun fact, I know Elena loves Buffy, the vampire slayer. And we are doing a read through, a table read, a Zoom read of one of the scripts from 2002 where I will be playing Buffy and all of the proceeds go to Color of Change and the Writers Guild Foundation, I believe. So if you guys want to check that out, look at my Twitter and my Instagram. I have information there. That's so but cool. I will be playing Buffy, which is really cool. <laughs> You're like, it's a dream. I'm <laughs> Buffy. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Um, and another question from Twitter. Lisa Arianas asks, if you could cross over with any show, what would it be? Oh. See, this is really hard <laughs> for a sitcom so yeah. I feel like you can only go into sitcom land or else it like just doesn't make sense you're like I, I don't want to go sitcom. Westworld could you imagine like I'm like <laughs> Buffy it just makes no sense <laughs> um I think for sitcom world Mr. Iglesias would be really fun because I forget her character name Marisol maybe Cree plays Marisol and she's also a Latina genius and I feel like that would be really cool to get us all mixed in there. Like maybe her and Elena can do a debate team episode. <laughs> but if I could go into any show ever, and if anybody who's watching is has followed me for any amount of time, they will know that it'll be Grey's Anatomy and I will do anything to be on Grey's Anatomy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting that out into the world as well. <laughs> I've been putting it out for so many years. Maybe it's just not in the cards, but like I will continue saying it. <laughs> It could happen. How many seasons are they on now? I think 15, 16. Whoa. It's so good. <laughs> um, and the same Twitter user uh, asks, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about your castmates? Family. It's so cheesy. It's all so true. gross. But we really, <laughs> like, I FaceTime Todd probably weekly we talk all the time. I mean, Justine and I were on the phone the other, like, it's just, they're really like my family and I adore those humans. And like, I really hope we get to be in each other's lives and work together for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And this person, the same Twitter user bombarded me with questions. I have them. I'm going to ask. So they asked, who is your celebrity crush? Huh? I don't think I have one right now. <gasps> Um, who is my celebrity crush oh you know who I don't even hold on I don't even know that I know his name right now because I just followed him Kendrick Sampson oh he's been super active for uh Black Lives Matter and that whole movement which is why I started following him because he posts a lot of really great information but he's also gorgeous like just like the most beautiful human you ever saw <laughs> and flash and how to get away with murder I mean he has almost a million followers I'm just out of the loop here but he is so beautiful and just like seems blown like away a person and so active in the in the movement and I that's my celebrity crush right now <laughs> and with everything that's been happening like how have you have you been involved in the movement as well Totally. I think 
I mean, I've been doing all the posting, I've been doing all the donating, I've been doing all the research, I've been doing all of that. I, I've been watching a lot of documentaries. Um, I was out prote protesting, which was so lovely. And by the way, if you haven't been protesting, please make sure to get tested for COVID. I did, I got a negative. Okay. Um, wear your masks, they work. Yes. People. Um, but yeah, I've totally been active in that. It just, sometimes it's a little hard <laughs> not to get discouraged but I think we've made so much progress and I think the black community deserves all the support they can get and there's all the rage that is happening in the world is so justified and, and they've been oppressed for so long and I think if we are able to provide a platform and amplify black black voices and if we can provide funds and if we can share knowledge and if we can do all that we absolutely should so if you go to my Instagram or my Twitter in my bio, there's a link um, that will lead you to a bunch of ways that you can educate yourself, that you can donate, that you can sign petitions, phone numbers you can call, et cetera, et cetera. Please get involved. And besides um, a lot of you know work with the Black Lives Matter, what else have you been doing during quarantine? God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's felt like maybe two days, but also three years. Um, I mean, I've been watching all the things. Like I said, I'm a huge reality TV person and I love MTV reality shows. Yeah. And so I've been catching up on the challenge. There was like a couple seasons I hadn't seen yet. So I've been doing that. Um, I went through like a really hardcore workout phase and then fell off of it and started like baking a lot. And I'm trying to get back on it now. Making um, bread. I haven't made bread. That's too complicated. When I say baking, I mean like I buy boxed cakes and do that. Like I can't, I'm not, I'm not culinary <laughs> like that. <laughs> but doing that, I mean, just trying to stay, I mean, I've been doing a ton of therapy. Girl, please, if you can, this is not the time to stop therapy, you guys. Um, but just taking the time to be really introspective and grow and sit with the uncomfortable and, and do, and obviously I'm in a super privileged position where I don't have to, I'm not a, a necessary worker and I don't have to be out there and just really sitting in that gratefulness and doing everything I can to help. And you said earlier that you liked watching, what is it, documentaries and stuff? What was the yeah. last that you've watched? I Am Not Your Negro uh, is the last one I watched. <sighs> heavy, real heavy, but I think it's it's necessary right now. It's super informative, um, especially I obviously have a ton of white passing privilege and I think it's really important that we understand what's happening and why it's happening and the history of it and that what's happening is in an isolated event and it's been going on. So that one's really good. 13th is really good. Netflix, I'm telling you, at everything. Bro. Everything. <laughs> um, and you mentioned therapy. Is that something that, you know, you find essential for your mental health now? Yes. I think everybody should be in yeah. therapy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started therapy my God, almost a year ago now. And it's been the best decision I ever made for myself. And uh, there's a lot of stigma. I mean, you as a Latina, you know, there's yeah. a lot of stigma in our culture about it. And so it took me a really long time to make that decision for myself. But it's for me, it works incredibly well. It's so necessary. I'm somebody that works out my problems out loud. And so it's, I mean, yeah. I love it. No, I get you. Like, I'm currently going through therapy and being Latina and just dealing with that. It's a lot. It's some heavy stuff, yeah. you know, but it's good. Um, and I wanted to ask, what would you say to fans that are having a bit of a rough time during this time of social distancing that maybe can't go and get therapy? Or I think be gentle with yourselves. I think it's a really tough time right now. and likely is you're not going to be okay through it and that's okay you don't have to try to pretend to be okay or rush to be okay or rush to be productive or creative or whatever um I think finding out what steps you can take to self-soothe is super important if you can't get therapy 
Um, I know there's apps that make it a lot cheaper. I think is it Talkspace or, or something? Uh, Headspace. Like that? Like, Headspace. Yeah. Or isn't that way? That's meditation, right? It's meditation, but it has like it's really really good. It's really good. Yeah. It has a bunch but of I stuff to sleep app- and help. Yes. I mean, meditation for sure. I have Headspace and I have Insight Timer, which are both great. But also there are apps that make um, therapy more accessible to people because it's way cheaper. I just wish I knew the names. But I'm sure if you look up therapy apps, they're there. Um, Moving your body in any way that you can is so helpful. Endorphins are so helpful. Journaling Make sure you're taking intentional breaths. When is the last time you actually breathed intentionally down to your stomach for a purpose? Do that. Relax your shoulders. Talk to people when you can. Um, And yeah, just try not to retreat into your own little world and make sure you're still connecting with humans, even if it's online. Yeah, or Zoom. Or Zoom. (laughs) How many Zoom meetings have you had to do during quarantine? Are you a pro? A disgusting amount it's insane <laughs> and I really feel like we should be able to fix some things about it like you know how like when you make a little noise a little green thing goes to the other person mm-hmm. and then it needs to drives me crazy because I just think we need to teach like a general zoom class and like if you're not talking mute yourself like it <laughs> oh yeah I have my finger like right over the mute I'm like listening is anybody home is there fireworks outside like <laughs> <laughs> well see this is easier because it's just the two of us but when you do those big meetings you're like you're doing like class on zoom or whatever then it's so many people and you're like please dear god we need some zoom etiquette yeah you need people to learn that mute button for themselves because you could be having a present or like a presentation and then boom it just like jumps to that little box yeah. um i'm gonna go on twitter for some more questions um from Elsa Perez will Elena speak more Spanish other than to just get Abuelita to listen to her (laughs) I don't know that's a good question um here's here's the problem is I am Colombian and when I speak Spanish you can tell and so when they have me speak in Spanish you can really tell that my accent is super different than the rest of the cast the rest of the cast is Puerto Rican so that's hey. tough because it just <laughs> it just takes you out a little bit of like this make-believe world um but I do think that she would be learning more actively I I don't know I like again that. I'm not a writer <laughs> <laughs> and uh what song from Sue Ann what song would you tell someone to listen to to know who you are the song that speaks to your life basically Oh, I'm not going to be able to answer that question. (laughs) I like don't even know how to follow the music industry in the sense of like, I could love an artist and never know their name, never know the names of their songs, nothing. So I don't know. But if you guys are looking for song recommendations, you can go listen to In the Heights, the musical to get ready for In the Heights next year, because it should have been this summer. And that was, oh my God, I love In the Heights. It's my favorite live show. And let's see. Another question from Nalu. Is there something about One Day at a Time that they haven't talked about yet that you would like them to cover? I know you said you're not a writer, but yeah. there must be things. Um, I mean, we're really so topical. <laughs> <laughs> that we've talked about so many things. Um, I think it would be interesting. We've talked on, on colorism before and we've had the conversation of, you know, Alex and Elena being different colors and how that changes yeah, how they can move in the world. But I think having a conversation about racism within the Latinx community would be really, really interesting because it's so prevalent and maybe it's just because this movement's happening right now. And so I'm seeing a lot more of it than I would like to. I wish we would stop that. Um, But I think it's a really interesting conversation to have. Okay. And last question from Queer the Lion. What have you learned about the queer community while playing Elena? How much perseverance and love there is in it. 
the community has been so oppressed for so long that they have every right to be jaded <laughs> and have all the negative emotions and still they are so filled with love and light and and so much fight and so much willingness to continue fighting not only for themselves but for each other and i think that we could all learn so much from that and that it would be a better world if we all had a little bit more of that and so like i said the the, Lat the latinx the lgbtq community feels like a second home to me and i feel very fortunate to be around them Thank you. And that's it for QFX's panel with Isabella Gomez. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. Thank you for everybody that has been watching and make sure to stick around because the QFX Virtual Artist Alley is coming right up. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a safe day. Bye. Thank you guys.